uh, that same energy, the same information as we're thinking about it in the moment that we're in and addressing parallel pandemics, uh, because certainly as we're looking uh, at this rapidly evolving emergency that we're sitting in and we're addressing and we're dealing with and navigating through, uh, we know that there's uh, ongoing pandemics that uh, communities, black and brown communities, uh, indigenous uh, communities have been facing uh, for centuries. Uh, and so we always have to make sure uh, that we do not lose that narrative. Um, and, has, and it is certainly part of the work uh, at the New York City Department of Health, uh, in sort of making sure that we are uh, thinking about the ways in which we're addressing uh, longstanding health inequities. Uh, and so it is a, a pleasure uh, and an honor to serve as the inaugural chief equity officer. Um, the principles of our agency, uh, the core foundations of our agency are three, science, equity, and compassion. Uh, it is the core of our work. Um, we use science uh, to make sure that we're informing the work that we do. At the crux and the center of it, the nexus of our work is equity. Uh, and that has to hold uh, uh, all of our components uh, together, the tools, are, the tools and the interventions that we use. And certainly leading with compassion and thinking about uh, the tells of two cities that we live in uh, and the vulnerabilities that exist. Uh, and so thinking about how we're meeting this moment, uh, we're certainly uh, focused on this resurgence and making sure that we're preparing for uh, mass vaccination. Um, but we're also thinking about the core public health work that we've been doing uh, for decades uh, and making sure that we're advancing an anti-racist public health practice has been part of the work of the agency uh, during this administration, so for the last seven, uh, six, seven years. And so happy um, and honored to, to serve under the leadership of Dr. Mary Bassett and Dr. Arcides Barbo, and now the commissioner, Dr. David Chosky, uh, where we're continuing to advance uh, a racial social justice lens in our agency. Um, and part of that work has been uh, elevating this position of a chief equity officer uh, to make sure that we're aligning our internal and external work. And so we'll, I'll talk a bit about uh, what we're doing uh, during this response uh, and how we're meeting this moment. Um, but I think it's always important to sort of ground the conversation uh, in, in sort of where we are um, and how we frame our work. And so we look at it from a place-based lens uh, as it's very important to be able to understand the inequities that exist uh, in New York City. Um, and looking at our outcomes, and you, many of you have probably seen this map uh, time and time again, uh, but it's important to contextualize. Um, yes, we see that people are dying, but the question is where and why. And we do see patterns uh, of where people are bearing the, the heaviest burden of disease and social and economic instability in New York City. Uh, and, uh, Central Brooklyn uh, is one of those locations. As you'll see in the maps in front of you, uh, even for these health outcomes like infant mortality, premature mortality, uh, dying before the age of 65, and even life expectancy. Uh, so the inverse and sort of seeing that individuals are dying young and experiencing excess premature mortality, all situated in the same areas, the South Bronx, uh, parts of uh, upper Manhattan, and then also in uh, North and Central Brooklyn. Uh, and then you'll start to see uh, some of those patterns start to show up in Queens. And so I'll address that as I go on of why we don't always sort of see Queens light up the same way um, as the other boroughs, given the diversity uh, that, that, uh, that is in Queens. Um, so even thinking about other health, health outcomes, uh, you know, HIV diagnosis, psychiatric hospitalizations, you continue to see the same patterns. Um, that this isn't, uh, you know, widespread, but this is uh, certainly um, situated in, in specific areas of, of New York City. Uh, and even when we look beyond for other social indicators, poverty, elementary school absenteeism. Uh, so thinking about uh, missingness from school uh, for more than 30 days, or even jail incarceration. 
um, that pattern is there. And the point of it is really to make sure that we contextualize that this isn't, uh, that health outcomes are not driven by biology or genetics, but this is absolutely um, external factors. These are social and economic forces that have led to uh, these longstanding health inequities. And so, you know, data is really helpful when we can contextualize the information, when we can talk about um, the historical marginalization of groups and understanding the history of colonialism. We just uh, wrapped up uh, the celebration uh, of, of Thanksgiving and understanding that the history of Thanksgiving is also a history of tragedy. Uh, and given the First Nation, the indigenous people who came, who were already here uh, and understanding the ideologies of white supremacy being rooted in the uh, development of this country. And given that we, this country is relatively young, 13 generations going through legalized uh, capture uh, and, and slavery, and then to, and four generations of segregation. Um, and now we're, we can say that we're legally free, um, but we're still dealing with the impacts of the policies and practices of uh, both the American slavery and also segregation or Jim Crow. And so we know that um, we're still feeling those impacts and certainly during the summer, um, dealing with the death of George, George Floyd and so many others, we know that there's so much more work that has to be done. And public health, I see, and that's the reason why I uh, joined um, a public health agency, because I see public health as a way in which we advance social justice uh, and, and address racial injustice. Uh, and it has been an opportunity to really, uh, uh, really push this agenda in the work that we do beyond just access to care. Um, and so where we are now, uh, as I mentioned, we're sitting in this pandemic, um, but this pandemic has certainly amplified uh, the inequities that we see, uh, the, uh, the differences, the disproportionate impacts of when you have um, an assignment of value uh, to one's color, uh, uh, to, um, to one's social position. And so that has led to why we're seeing these racialized impacts of COVID-19. This, um, what you're seeing before you are the, um, the state and city data milestones that we continue to use. And so percent positivity, hospitalizations, and a number of new cases. Uh, but when you push beyond and understand this aggregated by race and ethnicity, you can really begin to see the differences. Uh, and you know, and as Dr. Frazier had already mentioned, that there have been communities that have uh, disproportionately uh, been impacted more than others by COVID-19. And so it becomes our responsibility uh, the health department, uh, health systems, organizations, to really make sure that we're looking at ways in which we're closing the gap, in which we're reinvesting or providing more ways and interventions to address those inequities. Uh, and that work does not fall on one organization or one agency. It has to be a collective approach. Uh, and these are the ways in which we can really operationalize uh, an uh, uh, equity agenda. Um, part of it is also understanding where those missteps have happened. And even as an agency uh, that uh, has been um, prided on including an anti-racist lens uh, and really talking more about health equity, we understand that there are a lot of missteps that we have even um, been part of uh, as we look at previous structural um, or previous emergencies that we've responded to and how structural racism has shown up. Uh, you can think back to the Zika response uh, back in 2016. And during the Zika response, testing was also really, really important, particularly for women of reproductive age, women who were traveling to Central America, to South America. Uh, and, and understanding that those testing resources were not equitably allocated to uh, all hospitals, safety net hospitals, public hospitals, which really um, uh, caused uh, a lot of issues with really being able to identify uh, families, families who are part of undocumented families or families who are, um, uh, are in certain neighborhoods, not having access to Zika testing 
really shown some of the inequities uh, during that response. Um, and the same for during Hurricane Sandy, uh, particularly because of the history of redlining uh, and the ways in which disinvestment had happened in certain neighborhoods. You know, emergencies and these crises really do not provide the bandwidth or the wiggle room uh, to really uh, allow for individuals to, um, to be prepared for an emergency. Uh, and so the resources that are allocated need to be equitably allocate, allocated to make sure that we're supporting families giving history of disinvestment. And those are ways in which we're thinking about it now. Um, and certainly as we've shared this data, uh, individuals who've been impacted by COVID-19, we have been intentional about how we have uh, thought through our interventions and we've been thinking through uh, the ways in which we are uh, making sure that we try to respond to this resurgence that we are now in. So when you think back to uh, April, March, uh, and the headlines um, that really sort of amplified the persistent, systematic, uh, you know, intergenerational racism uh, that we've been confronted with, um, certainly one of the um, ways in which people have always talked about or have been talking about the need to provide more testing to make sure that we have been getting more resources out to communities. Uh, but, the, but the call uh, was much larger. Uh, the call was much larger to figure out how do you really change institutional policies and practices so that we're not constantly re repeating these inequities. Um, and now that we're in a resurgence, uh, certainly those conditions have not been uh, fully removed or eliminated. And so we're certainly seeing uh, those inequities even today. Uh, in other jurisdictions, we continue to see high rates of cases among um, the Latinx population. Uh, certainly uh, in other parts of, of jurisdictions, we're continuing to see um, Black communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. During wave one, as we call it, or uh, the initial uh, phase of this pandemic, um, we certainly saw uh, a high number, high rates of death among Latino populations, three times that of white population in New York City. Uh, and then for black communities, that was two times uh, the, the rate of, of, of the white population here in New York City. Um, understanding sort of what has led to uh, those inequities wasn't just access to care. And so some of these headlines sort of talk through uh, some of the systematic issues that really uh, reared this ugly head during the first phase of this response. And part of the, again, our work has been to not only identify it, but also to figure out ways that we address uh, those issues. And I think it's always sort of framing it as how we think about health. Um, I think one, uh, it's a narrative change. Uh, it's making sure that we're clear, not always placing blame on or victimizing groups. Um, you, you remember early on in the, uh, in the, the pandemic, uh, the focus on China and blaming China for the spread. When we knew or began to learn how the spread started from Europe or even in America, uh, even in New York, this, um, uh, this focus to stigmatize uh, Asian American communities here in New York City, uh, and then beginning to blame or talk about how communities uh, were not following certain guidelines uh, or, or effective prevention measures. So it's a shift in narrative that is so important in how we use data, how we're telling that, that story, uh, and how we're dealing with risk communication. Um, and I think data is really important, not only the quantitative part of it, but also qualitative. And so using numbers, but also making sure that we're using qualitative information to be, to a, to be able to really contextualize the concerns and issues. Um, then it's also not really focusing on just the outcome, right? Uh, someone is sick, uh, someone needs to be tested, someone dies, but it's also understanding the factors that really lead to those poor outcomes. And so the living conditions, also understanding the institutional changes that are necessary, that are needed uh, and really working with hospitals to really um, address those changes that are needed at, at, 
at staff levels and even at, at an institutional level. And so we'll talk a little bit more about the ways in which we've been trying to work with healthcare systems to even make sure that they're responding to this moment and addressing communities of color. Uh, and this has certainly been a national focus. Uh, this I showed you some of the headlines and here are some of the examples uh, that are happening in other jurisdictions. And we have been uh, in constant communication and collaboration with other jurisdictions to talk through their equity response. And so uh, in Chicago, where they recently named a chief uh, equity officer at the health department and also a chief racial equity officer in the mayor's office, uh, has implemented what they're calling uh, their racial equity rapid response team, uh, where they are bringing together traditional and non-traditional partners, health care, community-based organizations, uh, the health department, the mayor's office, also academic partners to use data, to use resources, to really make sure that individuals are being connected to uh, testing resources and be able to safely isolate but then it's also a way to really address some of the social and economic instability. Um, and uh, so that, that's in Chicago, uh, in California. So I, I think that there are three main points that I really wanted to make sure uh, that I, I got across. Um, and particularly we're, we're talking about advancing an equity agenda um, and no matter sort of where uh, we are in our professional journey, and particularly for those who are starting off uh, in um, the early on in their career. I think the important part is, uh, I, I do think public health is, is going to be uh, a key role, uh, no matter what your specialty is or however you are um, contributing to uh, this conversation, uh, because um, public health sort of really sits at this idea of how we are activating communities and really thinking about a place-based lens. And I think the an important part of, of really maximizing um, our public health principles uh, is making sure that one, we're using our data uh, in a responsible way. How we talk about our data and not just those inequities and saying black people are three times more likely fill in the blank but really sort of making sure that we're contextualizing those inequities in a way that we're uh, also uh, integrating the social and economic inst instabilities, the living conditions, and certainly uh, the historical traumas that have happened in this country. Um, that is really the way in which we uh, get at closing the gap, uh, is making sure that the historical context is part of the narrative uh, and we can use the narrative in a way uh, to really make sure that we're highlighting these injustices and that is a responsible way, but also finding solutions and generating those solutions mean also telling the story and also integrating the voices of those who are, who are really living the experiences. The second part is thinking about our interventions. Our interventions are, are, are robust and we don't have to just think about it as clinical practice. Clinical physicians um, are key, uh, but really uh, are not the only answer uh, and certainly, if we're going to uh, be successful, we really have to think about this as a collaborative approach uh, and really thinking about how we're bringing housing specialists, uh, social service specialists, researchers, physicians, also thinking about doulas and community health workers to the table and to really think about how we can really work together and find the solutions. Uh, and those interventions sort of span from engagement to home visits and also thinking about the ways in which we can uh, deliver services. Because the important part is also that it's, we're integrating bi-directional communication. This is not only about sharing information with those who need it, but it's also making sure that we're capturing the stories and the experiences of what our patients, our clients, whomever we're serving, we're bringing them back to the policymakers, the decision makers. And that's certainly been a part of the work during this response. As we have uh, implemented a place-based strategy during uh, our COVID-19 response, we've been calling it a hyper-local strategy. We brought this particularly during the summer to really address areas where we've been seeing low testing and high percent positivity. 
percent positivity tells us that there's a lot of disease activity or community transmission that's happening. Now we're seeing it citywide, but certainly during the summer we were at um, a lowest point of community transmission, but we still saw areas where there were um, high disease activity where the percent positivity was above 3%. Now we're across the city, we're above 3%, actually above 4%. And really what we saw was that there were lack of testing. Uh, there was not enough information that was really um, circulating. Uh, and so really through this approach, we have been really working to make sure that we were um, uh, working with our community partners, our clinical partners, also working with uh, a number of faith-based organizations to not only bring the resources, but also to be the main messengers. Uh, I think that this is gonna to continue to be important as we think about our uh, citywide vaccination planning. Uh, and certainly I'm sure that there are questions uh, just around what the city is doing and planning for. Uh, I think that this is going to be um, a really important uh, time for us to really think about uh, these place-based strategies. Uh, and I know that this is uh, the, the very reason why Arthur Ashe even established the Institute for Urban Health, to think about um, neighborhood investments, and not only think about access, but think about the ways in which we can really address health inequities collaboratively and think about it through a collect collective approach. Where we go, uh, and I think this is the next step, uh, will really define uh, you know, our equity agenda. Um, it's part of thinking about our federal administration. And I think that it's very promising that the people uh, have spoken uh, and we were able to really elect uh, an administration uh, that um, uh, connects to these ideals of uh, addressing uh, injustice and equity. And I think the type of investments that have already been a part of the Build Better Buy plan for the Biden-Harris administration leads to the, re the reinvestment that we need around workforce, around infrastructure. Uh, and certainly we're paying more attention to how uh, some of those investments will really lead to some of the work that we're doing. Um, the long-term economic recovery um, relies on this vaccine. This is a new biomedical intervention that's, new, that, um, that's using new techno technology, the mRNA vaccine, two of them now are on the market uh, and at the speed in which they have been developed certainly uh, invokes uh, skeptic skepticism and a lot of mistrust. And so uh, there has to be conversations and dialogue, particularly about the historical context, but also about the importance of, of participating uh, in this process and understanding why the importance of taking this vaccine gets us to a new normal. <clears throat> and then last, defining <clears throat> the future uh, also means defining our uh, long-term economic recovery. Um, thinking about our small businesses, thinking about um, how we are changing the landscape of our public housing, uh, also thinking about the ways in which we are supporting um, our public health workforce. Um, uh, this isn't the first pandemic and it certainly will not be the last pandemic. Uh, and, and thinking about how we're not only uh, supporting our healthcare systems, but beyond that, our primary care, our federally qualified health systems, our community health workers, our doulas, to really be a part of a public health infrastructure that we have not realized before. Uh, and those are the things that we're sort of thinking about now. Um, we are certainly eyes on the prize on this resurgence and certainly thinking about this vaccine, but we're also sort of looking ahead as well uh, to what, the, what kind of city, what kind of communities that we want to reimagine. Uh, and so, those are the three areas. And I think that those are the ways in which organizations and communities and even students can continue to tap in and be a part of this conversation. So I'll stop. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Easterlin, for that timely and engaging uh, conversation and the presentation that you, you've presented. At this time, I want to introduce someone on our team who doesn't really need any introduction, but it, I will introduce him. Mr. Umberto Brown serves as our Director of Health Disparities and New Constituency Initiatives. And, and he has been on the front lines as an activist and a humanitarian as well, like Arthur Ashe. And, and at this time, I would like to introduce Umberto to facilitate a conversation based on what we have heard so far. So Umberto Brown. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, thank you, my brother. Uh, 
auditorium for that presentation, which I think is important <clears throat> because it connect the essential of what we're facing, right? The historical condition that create the inequities that we're facing, the legacy of it, it established some of the institutions are impacted by these traditions, these legacies, what James Ball would have called these lies, right? This construct of inferiority of certain groups versus others. But I think more importantly, you, you ended with the challenges of what do we do moving forward? What do we learn? How do we integrate uh, what we live in in the 21st century? Because I think the Arthur S. legacy is that we have to be a voice that speak for social justice. And Arthur risked everything he had, including his, his, his fame and his celebrity, to bring that voice about justice to the discussion. So that's what we do every day beyond the disease and beyond the, the failures of health system is to make sure that the voices of those impacted by those policies are there to make sure that when we design policies, when we establish programs, we are just in it and thinking of the people who are impacted by those, that data that you share, you know, the letter of who's impacted negatively from most of this policy. So uh, one of the comments or the question I raised to you is that <clears throat> I'm impressed because of the work that you all have done, including when Dr. Mary Bassett was the lead of, uh, of, the, of the institution, is the role of creating a partnership with community-based organization and with communities. And I think that we are in a moment where there's an essential practice as we raise the question about the vaccine and trust, only those trusted relationships will define people participation and level of trust that they're included from to benefit from this the same way where we, we get the negative impact of it. So I just want to raise a question again of how, what is the strategy to include these communities? And that the strategy is not only these fragmented ways of just program, but in co-designing the responses. Uh, and I want to put it in the context that we talk about population health, but when we talk about population, I think it, it kind of homogenize people, it neutralize, and all population and are treated the same. So being an immigrant coming from Latin America, coming from the people who are uh, 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 the African community here and the issue of immigration status matters. Do you access, do you think of the right to access it and how much of risk you put the rest of your family who's undocumented or waiting to be a citizen when you, when you, when you, when you show up or give your address and those challenges. So I just wanna raise some of those things that we face Every time these crises come, these are the kind of phone call we receive. Should I trust? Should I go? Should I take my aunt who's undocumented? How do I get support for these people? So I just want to bring that sector in and hopefully knowing you and some of the tradition that at least there is a voice there to say we have to bring people in now to have the hard discussion, not when we fail to meet those deadlines. And uh, if there's any other questions uh, in the chat, then we'll follow. But I'd like to hear your comments about some of those uh, issues I just raised. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I don't like following you, Humberto. I mean, I think you're a hard act to follow. Um, but uh, I, I'll say a couple of things on it. And I, I think, you know, again, I think you hit all the, the right sell your points. Um, I, I really do think that. Uh, for this vaccine plan to be successful. And we have been working on it. Our agency has really been thinking through this. Um, we are really going to have to have shared leadership. Uh, there's no question. And 
Commissioner Chakshi and I have been talking about this uh, for, for weeks now. Um, we, we truly understand that this is not going to be something that's successful if government is really out in the forefront every day, all day, talking about the vaccine. I think we're gonna to have to really activate uh, and invest in organizations to really be the messengers, to really lead in their communities, to think about the infrastructure in which is really going to be able to connect to, the, to, to people, uh, people where they are mo most comfortable, whether it's in uh, their house of worship or whether it's in their community center, um, we're gonna to have to be really innovative here. We're gonna to have to really stretch our imagination. Things that we have not done before, we will really have to think about in 2021, if we are truly going to achieve uh, the type of herd immunity that's gonna be necessary for us to get out of this pandemic. What I can say is that we are building off of some of the successes that we've had in the past, both during the measles vaccine uh, or the measles outbreak and also during H1N1 outbreak. Uh, and some people may know during the H1N1 outbreak, the vaccine took longer. Uh, the technology wasn't as advanced as it is now, which is why we have these two, MNR, two uh, mRNA vaccines uh, that have already um, been submitted to FDA for emergency use authorization approval. Uh, we had 50 points of dispensing operations situated throughout the city. Uh, and these are emergency operation sites that really allow us to flow, flow, get a throughput, allow people to come through and get a vaccine rapidly. Um, and we're looking at sort of standing up those operations as well. But it's not just going to rely on the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We're going to have to really partner with FQHEs and the healthcare systems, really trying to activate community vaccinators as well to be out in the community and talking about uh, the vaccines. Um, uh, but something, Roberto, that you also mentioned, the, the, the starting point is having a conversation. Uh, people know that there are, right now, there are three vaccines that have, uh, that we've seen some press release around the Pfizer vaccine, Moderna vaccine, and also AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca, we know that there have been some challenges and issues. And of course, someone hears that, then what are the issues and challenges for the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine? And then, uh, you know, you look at the vaccine effectiveness for the AstraZeneca, and by the time that is ready to be shipped out, uh, there are going to be questions. There is a lower effectiveness than compared to the Pfizer and, and Moderna. And so is that the one that's going to be in the community? Why is the community getting the vaccine with a lower effectiveness? There are all types of questions, and they're not necessarily built on conspiracy. They're, they're built on valid concerns, and valid concerns because the trust uh, of healthcare systems have failed black and brown communities. And I think we have to be honest about that. And I think providers have to be honest about the privilege that they do have by being physicians and care and, and providers and uh, in clinical spaces, but also they have to own the legacy uh, of distrust and mistrust that has been um, bestowed upon them as well. And so I do think physicians have to be a part of that solution. Uh, in repairing that trust in communities, um, particularly uh, safety net hospitals, uh, community hospitals that sit uh, in black and brown communities across this city. Uh, and so uh, right now we are starting to mobilize and organize black and brown physicians to start really thinking through uh, our strategy. I think we're gonna have to activate other groups as well. Uh, as some of you, Fabian already knows, we have organized the test and trace community advisory board. And so we'll certainly be activating that group. And there, we're gonna really have to think through our organizing principles and, and get to work here. Uh, I, I, I see this as the next most important thing uh, in this phase of the pandemic, um, while we still address uh, racial injustice. Umberto, you're muted. Thanks, uh, Thorn. Uh, Fabian, there's any other question? We don't have a lot of time, so I would like to get other people. If there's any other question for Thorin. There's no questions in the chat box at the moment, but folks feel free to use the chat box or um, unmute yourselves to ask any questions that you may have for Dr. Easterling before we wrap up. Uh, yeah, I just want to say one other thing I, I, I failed to share. Um, I think that I've been in some of the, the discussion with some of the 
community engagement in some of these uh, COVID-19 vaccine, right, with various universities. And my concern when I talk about the dialogue is that we treat communities like community are, are illiterate, illiterates. And so we ask to be joined these things, assuming that all we need to do is go and implement. And I think the issue, what I'm talking about hard dialogue is I'm happy where you ended, Artorian, that we have to convince this community about the value of the science and the safety of it. We can assume they should just come in because they're desperate or they can get paid to do it. These are essential way of having these hard dialogue. I, I also want to, since another question, is that when we talk about racism, why I respect uh, Dr. Bassett, uh, we invited her a few times to downstate and other places to speak because there are a few people talk out racism, a personalized, that make people make decisions that they're not even aware that those decisions will impact people negatively. So the issue is not just describing it, but explaining when you have those voices there, how it impact a specific community and why it's important to understand the complexity of those, those population and their needs that they don't get stigmatized. So um, I think that those things will be very crucial in such a, a, a difficult moment because the, the previous experience when we had to go to the hospital, people were scared to go because they told them there were no tests. Latinos die, a lot of Latinos die at home because they tell they didn't know what to do when they go there. Should they trust the system? Uh, so I just raise those issues because I think they're a relevant issue for the future. It's not a discussion of the past, but how would we move forward? So thank you for, for, for the comments and that you will be, I know you will have voice to make sure that we're in those conversations because people are raising a lot of questions and we need to answer those questions honestly and truthfully and take their, their fear into serious consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that I, I think we, we need to, uh, and that goes back to one of our core foundations, we need to lead with compassion. Uh, you know, science and equity is gonna be important. On well, the science side, there's so much information that has not been shared about the vaccine. You know, certainly we've only seen the data through press releases. We have not seen any scientific articles that have come out. And so, you know, I still have just a little bit of, I have questions and some skepticism about the vaccines uh, myself. And I still think uh, that it's gonna be really important that we take the vaccine. And so I think some transparency and honesty, even with our leaders uh, will be helpful. Uh, certainly from an equity standpoint, thinking about the locations, even when we where we are, um, deploying and uh, distributing vaccine to, to really uh, ensure access, uh, particularly thinking about um, communities that are not as mobile or they're really thinking about um, specific access points for individuals, but the compassion is gonna be important. Uh, uh, that, you know, certainly with vaccine hesitancy, uh, complacency uh, is certainly a concern. Confidence, uh, Humberto, as you're, you're talking about, because that confidence uh, has not been earned. Um, by, by so many uh, in our community that we, we need to make sure uh, that that is something that we're leading with, that we're really trying to regain the confidence of, 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 of our community. Um, so, absolutely. Dr. Easterling, I think you just brought up a point that connects to one of the questions that we have in the chat box. Um, Janelle asked, do you think healthcare professionals taking the vaccine will help community members trust the vaccine? A number of healthcare professionals, especially minorities, have indicated that they are not willing to get vaccinated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we, just to just to hit on the the last point about uh, uh, BIPOC communities not wanting to take the vaccine. Uh, just in October, our agency uh, did what we did. Um, we conducted our health opinion poll, uh, which is usually through text messages and telephone surveys, uh, and. Uh, you know, those who identify as being Black and African American, uh, only about 38% uh, of those who responded to the survey said that they would take the vaccine. Uh, so uh, nearly 70% uh, of individuals are saying that they're not uh, taking the vaccine. Uh, that's a large number. Uh, and then even across the city, um, just citywide, uh, even a little over 50%. And so we have our work cut out for us. And so uh, I think uh, any group, uh, healthcare providers, absolutely. Uh, most people really rely on their providers uh, to feel confident in taking a vaccine. When even thinking about some of the 
uh, more long-standing vaccines that we have from uh, the pneumococcal vaccine to the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. You know, they're really relying on their providers, the flu vaccine, to really encourage them. And so absolutely, uh, I think we're going to really have to uh, activate our um, providers across the city to get in front of a camera, to get on social media, uh, get on their platforms, uh, and encourage people. Um, but that first has to be that they are comfortable with the data. Uh, I'm not forcing anyone uh, to take the vaccine. Uh, I don't want to be forced to take the vaccine. Uh, and I think others who are going to be important, uh, uh, faith-based leaders are going to be important. Uh, elected officials are gonna be important. Certainly individuals who participated in the vaccine trial. Uh, Dr. Chris Purnell, a good friend of mine who uh, is, uh, is an executive uh, position at a, a hospital, university hospital in North, participated in the vaccine trial uh, and has been uh, on the airwaves talking about why she participated in the vaccine trial, has really been uh, out in the forefront, um, really talking about that science and data is gonna be important here. Uh, and certainly we need to acknowledge the longstanding history. We, and we often stop with um, Tuskegee, but we know that there have been so many other atrocities from Mississippi appendectomies to Henrietta Lacks and the list goes on. So uh, we, we're, we know that these are valid concerns. And so we're gonna have to activate any and everyone, Dr. Frazier as well. So that raises uh, the next question. So in addition to healthcare providers, uh, Joyce Hall asks, how do you see programs and schools of public health involved in vaccine education and in communities of color? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I think that now's the time sort of to think creative about uh, activating um, a vaccine core uh, that will in, uh, include uh, public health students who are out uh, engaging communities, talking to residents about the vaccine, um, helping individuals navigate uh, to locations. Uh, so, I, I, you know, these are things that we've certainly been thinking about, uh, and we're going to be coming to, you know, Long Island University, to SUNY Downstate, uh, to CUNY, uh, to really, uh, really rely on the students uh, to really help and get the message out. Thank you. And we have another related question. Um, so we've talked about providers, we've talked about the schools of public health, and the, we have a question from Cheryl Hall asking, what do you think will be the role of community health workers as we work in our communities to encourage them to be vaccinated? Yeah, I, I think the first step, uh, as we learn more about the allocation strategy, and so uh, some may be already uh, may already know uh, that the governor had announced that um, in this first phase, because New York City is going to receive about 170,000 doses, uh, which will allow us to vaccinate individuals in long-term care facilities, so nursing homes, uh, you know, uh, congregate settings where we have individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, also, you have uh, adult uh, homes as well, uh, and then also. Um, healthcare workers who are most at risk. And so you're thinking about your nurses, your physicians that work in the intensive care unit or the emergency room, or even the EMS um, uh, providers. Because of their high risk act activity, they're going to fall in the first phase. That's one, that's phase one, one A. And one B, um, and this is where we, you know, there's still uh, more discussions that are happening. Uh, CDC's uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices have not voted on 1B just yet. Uh, but I think the, the, the area that I think community health workers and doulas are going to be important in really raising and advocating for, um, for, their, for their staff. Uh, because because of the type of work that we community health workers are doing, I think that they need to be a part of the next phase, the 1B. Um, and so I think that's where it starts um, to make sure that we're, uh, because many of our doulas, our community health workers are not connected to a healthcare system. Uh, and so the, there's not a strong platform for our community health workers to advocate uh, to make sure that they get the vaccine. Again, not forcing it, but make, making sure that they're included and integrated into the plan. And then once they have a vaccine, then certainly they, they should be a part of outreach and messaging and education. All right, and we have one final question that we'll close with, and, and this may be a tough one, but 
what would be the single best reason to convince communities of color to get the vaccine? The single best reason? Yes. I think the single best reason is to make sure that we are uh, uh, really supporting and giving us our, our, an opportunity uh, to uh, fight for our communities uh, and to ensure that we're protect, uh, protecting our loved ones. Uh, yes, there are a lot of questions around this vaccine, um, but um, we also know of the horrors and tragedies that we experienced in March and April. I mean, Brother Humberto also mentioned individuals dying at home, phone calls that I received in March uh, of individuals not wanting to go to the hospital. Uh, we have to remind ourselves of what we what we went through, what we experienced. We all, everyone has been touched by this. And so we do not want to return there. Uh, and so I think the single most reason is that we want to preserve life, uh, that we want to protect uh, the life of our loved ones. And I think that's enough to at least have a conversation, to at least be in dialogue, to understand the science and the data, and then make an informed decision. Um, but I think that, that is where I would start. Right, and I know that I said that that was the last question, but we have one last question um, and then we'll close um, with Dr. Frazier. Um, so one last question, given that 10% of physicians are black or Hispanic, should we focus more on HHA, CNA nurses instead of just physicians to bring across the message on the importance of the vaccine? The focus seems to be on minority physicians to bring across the message. Good question. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and and uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't comprehensive. Uh, we we're talking to uh, we're going to be talking to Nisna, talking to 1199, uh, because we know the power of 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 labor uh, in New York City. We know the power of their voice and, and being able to really hit the ground. And so we've already been, you know, reaching out to 1199. We've already been uh, in, in um, collaboration with them, doing some work in, in East Brooklyn uh, through our East Brooklyn Call to Action work. And so, uh, absolutely, we'll be working with, uh, um, you know, nurses, uh, all levels of, of health professionals. Uh, uh, you know, I just need to overemphasize, and this is, you know, I think uh, this is where over communication is going to be effective communication. Uh, that we need to think big. I think the, the challenge here is not thinking big enough so that we can really ensure that we're protecting our communities. Thank you, Dr. Easterling, and thank you, Umberto, for getting the conversation started. I will pass the baton to Dr. Frazier. Thank you, Fabian. Uh, Dr. Easterling, thank you so much for your conversation. Thank you, Umberto, for facilitating that. Amidst all the Zoom bombing, I thank you all for keeping Grace under pressure and getting us through this. And I thank everyone for coming. I know the Institute has been here for 28 years and we have had a lot of accomplishments of which we are so proud, but we know that there's still so much to be done as you have all mentioned in terms of the things that, that we need to, to have done. Uh, we, we are the Institute, we are proud of our programs and we hope that our programs can be the place that we can move the needle in addressing health inequity. So with our programs, with our students, the next generation of healthcare professionals that will be going out there, we hope that they will be the ones to, to see the changes that we hope for, the changes that we hope to see in healthcare. Uh, with our barbers and our stylists and our community-based partners, we hope that we can continue to champion the cause of the Institute. Uh, before we end, I would like to thank everyone for coming. I would like to thank all of you who continue to support the Institute. Had we been in person, we would probably have had lunch at this time, but we're not. And, and I, But I still thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here with us. I would like to thank uh, the communications folks at SUNY Downstate, uh, Don, Skeet Walker and her team, especially uh, Sean Till. I would like to thank Dr. Kathy Powderly, who has been a staunch supporter of the Institute from its inception because the Institute was founded in her division. And I would like to thank all of those that have 
come out today, I'd like to thank my former CEO, Dr. Ruth Brown, who, who is here today with us, uh, all of our community partners, all of our friends. Uh, Brett, I thank you so much for your opening remarks. And again, I thank our Arthur Ashe team, the staff that makes my work easier every day. And so I thank you and I look forward to the other years ahead for the Institute and we look forward to being in person. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not at the next one. We hope, look forward to being in person soon again. And so enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for taking the time once again. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank Bye -bye. you.